Okay, welcome everybody to, I believe this is the third session of the Vermont Vegetable and Berry Growers Association webinar series. And today we have partnered with the Vermont Nursery and Landscape Association um, to partner on our discussion today. And I'm Laura Johnson, I work for UVM Extension and um, I'm gonna hand it over to Ralph, who's representing the Vermont Nursery and Landscape Association to introduce our speakers. And um, we'll go from there. Thank you, Laura. So good morning, everybody. I'm Ralph Fitzgerald. Um, I am the vice president of the Vermont Nursery and Landscape Association. And we'd like to welcome you all here. So our first speaker is Sarah Salatino, who is the owner and um, chief cook and bottle washer at uh, Full Circle Gardens, and I've known Sarah a long time. And so um, and they, a very extensive um, bio here, and I'll just re read off a couple things. She's a Vermont certified horticulturist. In 2013, she was awarded the Environmental Awareness Award from the BNLA. She is also a part of the New England Greenhouse Growers Conference and has been very in, 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 instrumental in that. Um, she has... Um, a undergraduate degree from UC Stanford, Santa Cruz, and in, in um, California. And our other presenter this morning is Spencer Hardy. Um, actually, uh, Sarah's business is located in Essex Center on Brigham Hill Road. Is that right, Sarah? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then um, Spencer Hardy um, is from Jericho. Um, he is he's someone new to me, um, and I've been very interested in hearing him talk. He's been very involved with um, Vermont bumblebee studies, and he also did a bunch of bumblebee studies in, in Sierra Nevada, Colorado. Um, he's a graduate from Middlebury College, and he also worked with the Lewis Creek uh, Watershed uh, Association. So um, good morning, and I'll turn it over to Sarah and Spencer. Great. Hi, I'm Sarah Salatino. Um, not terribly techno savvy, but I think I did. I do. Oh, here we go. All right, great. Um, You're good. Thank, thank you. Phew. Okay, moving on. I'm with Full Circle Gardens, and um, this business has been going since 2010, and I've been um, growing na natives and, and pollinator plants uh, since the the onset. Um, to me, that's always been an important thing to do. However, when it came to marketing, I didn't really pull them out and identify them as such. If people wanted to go through, I would explain things and, um, you know, why, who's pollinating what, why plants are getting eaten, why I'm not doing anything about it. Um, and then uh, March 17th, 2016 hit, I attended the... Um, what was it? Symposium on Vermont's pollinators. That had to be, for me, one of the most jaw-dropping, eye-opening um, symposium I've ever attended. Um, I laid in bed that night awake thinking, oh my God, I'm going to have to get rid of a lot of my plants, perennials that I grow, um, because I want to be able to um, help pollinators and, and natives. And then I thought, wait a minute, does that mean I have to throw all my peonies that I grow in, in the compost? And I thought, you know, it's about a balance. It's about making sure that we're taking good care of our environment, as well as getting people to come in and buy things so that you can start explaining things to them. Um, so with that, that's how we roll at Full Circle Gardens. I would say that we're probably at this point, 75% native slash pollinator plants. And I'll explain the definitions in a little bit, what that means to us. And the rest is um, things that are, that are uh, landscapers like, things that the general public really likes to plant such as, as peonies. Um, but yeah, our focus is becoming more and more on natives. And I think at some point we're probably just going to do that. Now, here's my next slide. Here's my next, there we go. 
Um, this is how we see what we grow. Um, there's the old good old Venn diagram from fourth grade math that shows um, that there's natives and pollinator plants. And then there's some natives that are not pollinator plants and some pollinator plants that are not natives. And, you know, I wanna take, take you back, I believe to um, uh, when Pangea uh, was formed here. This is um, something that um, Peter Van Berkham from Van Berkham Nurseries has talked about at various um, uh, symposia. And I, I do really agree with him is that there was all a whole bunch of natives on Pangea in the beginning. And then when the continents split up, some went one way, some went the other way. Um, and one of the things that I've observed in 14 years of growing is that there's a lot of pollinator plants that are really highly used by all kinds of pollinators that are not native. Um, and since our goal here is to, two things, is to provide plants for, um, for re restoring native habitat, as well as encouraging pollinators. Um, so I started thinking after I started hearing all these talks on how we should just grow natives, and I kind of say this with the hash, you know, whatever quotations, and I'll get into that a little bit later, is that how do I tell the bees and the butterflies to stay off of our Northern European perennials like catmint, salvia, scabiosa, lavender, they all flock to it. They all seem to spend a lot of time on it. I've observed that they've, the bees have gone away with, lot, with more pollen hanging onto their back legs. So how can I deny them that? So that also brings up another thing. Um, when you think about um, native plants and pollinator plants, there's also a lot of um, controversy and, and, and misinformation out there about what constitutes, in my mind, natives and, and especially natives. Now, um, a lot of folks are very well-meaning and a lot of uh, amateur organizations are doing great work, but they're a little black and white about their definitions. Um, here at my nursery, how I see natives is there are, there's natives and then what I call native selections. And I think that's a term that's also used um, at Van Berkham Nursery, who I really trust, and also at Mount Cuba. That's another place that I really trust as well. And a native selection is, so there's, and we grow a lot of them, and I've really researched them. So say you have a big, a big group of um, Echinacea purpurea, and then what are those white ones way in the back? That was white swan. Somebody decided to, um, dig a few up, collect some seed perhaps, and they came true to form. And this is nature's way of saying, let's try something different. And it did seem to work. Um, and I can show you a picture of that later. Um, and also like Magnus, Magnus is a great uh, pollinator plant and, and native. What it does is it doesn't have the droopy leaves that Echinacea purpurea has. It has leaves that stick up and act as kind of like a, um, a satellite dish, which gets more uh, pollinators to come in. So these are uh, native selections that we sell at our nursery and we stand by those. Um, now you have hybrids um, that have been uh, developed in, in by human hands, by cross pollinating, um, you know, done in a lab. A lot of times these plug companies will patent them and they're sterile. Um, my feeling is, is um, if you, I'm not going to shame into people into uh, growing them because I grow some myself. But once again, it's that thing I do to to get other people to come in and see the plants that they want, but also say try this as well, give this a chance as well. So, um, and one does have to be very, very careful. Um, it in. Um, Let's see, in bu buying plants in from plug companies, um, there's a lot of gardening magazines out there as well as some trade magazines where they have branded, um, uh, branded plants, branded perennials and, and also um, 
um, shrubs and trees where they say attracts pollinators. And that's great, but they're sterile as all get out. They're patented. And it's kind of like um, they uh, will, yes, they'll attract pollinators to your garden. Like I'll be attracted to uh, smells coming from a bakery. But when I stick my nose up against the window, there's nothing there. And uh, so that's kind of like the way this misinformation goes. So getting back to things is you need to think about what your definition is. Are you going to grow natives and pollinator plants? Um, and are you going to grow just the, the um, locally local ecotype natives? And, and what are local ecotype natives? I go with um, North, New England and some Northeast natives, you know, whatever will grow in Vermont. People are often asking me, well, do you have Vermont natives? It's like, well, kind of, but they grow all over New England. So I don't really, you know, have things that are specific to Vermont. Um, plants really don't know state lines at all. So anyway, you need to think about uh, what you want to grow for you. Also, my feeling is that there's a lot of people, consumers out there that would be really happy with um, getting brought in to the fold uh, of what you grow and also being offered other kinds of plants as, as a come on, if you will. So I'm gonna show you a few things here. This is a syrphid fly on an early season pansy. Pansy that was grown in uh, my greenhouse. And, and um, while I don't have it crawling in and taking um, pollen, um, you know, I, I did get a picture of it so that you can see it's not necessarily natives that serve the pollinator plants. Here we have Astrantia, which is from Northern Europe. And um, there, is, there is a wasp on there enjoying a, an early season drink. Another thing I wanted to show you is, um, oh, this is, this is a, a fun shot. Um, if you look in the middle of the photograph, this is Pensamen digitalis. It is definitely native. Um, and I do love showing my customers how the bees pollinate by sticking their heads in and showing their butts. Um, that always gets a laugh. Um, once again, here is, a, a, I think it's a fritillary on Echinacea white swan, um, and they seem to spend a lot of time on our white swans here. And then here is Magnus. As you can see, the petals kind of stick out. That's a black swallowtail. Um, pretty amazing. So another thing that happens is when you, you have to be careful about how you grow your plants, um, one of the things I do is I'm very transparent with um, my um, how I grow things. If people want to know what sprays I use, I'm essentially no spray, um, though I have used it at times um, uh, the sea fungicide, which is organically certified, um, though I do go and spray it like last year was a joke. Um, I do go try and spray it early in the morning or late at night, but um, that's about it. I let um, my plants get eaten or, or damaged, if you will, because I want to show people that this is another reason why we need to grow natives. We, we need to not spray. We need to make sure that they're well taken care of. Here is, I want to show you this one first. So this is, I know a lot of you who grow milkweed, Asclepius tuberosa and Asclepius um, incarnata. As you can see, it is loaded with the always present in the late summer oleander aphids. It's like every single year it happens. It doesn't matter what I do, they always come. And of course, we have a monarch caterpillar on there. So am I going to spray? No. But Here's what I do is I sit and wait. If you look, I don't have a pointer, but look on the leaf that's above the um, caterpillar. And this is blurry, but look on the other leaf. Those are aphid mummies. So what has happened is our parasitic wasps, which are attracted to our uh, mats because of the um, habitat plantings we do. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. They first start and then it's, there's a, a couple of blurry, especially on this yellow leaf, um, ladybug larvae. 
And it's to me, it's an absolute amazing thing to see. Sure, the plants don't look sellable, but I think it's a great way to explain to your customers that you're going to take the best care you possibly can of your environment. Um, and that if they just wait, that patience is sometimes the best pesticide. So here's another miracle that happened here. I haven't seen them in recent years. Some of you may recognize um, the giant swallowtail caterpillar larva. And as you can see, the leaves on my tilia, which is a native understory uh, tree here, are getting really eaten. And sometimes um, we've had years where the, the tree has almost lost all its leaves. And then miraculously, within a couple of weeks, it's budded out like crazy. So this is another way to show people, your customers, that it's really okay, um, that things will survive on their own, that natives uh, will, will prevail in the end. Um, so what I wanted to do was to show you our um, habitat planting, and I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with that. Um, thank you to um, Dr. Cheryl Sullivan at UVM, the entomology lab. They're the ones that uh, got us started on these habitat plantings. And it's got a lot of um, composite flowers like zinnias and echinacea. There are sunflowers, which are, you know, annuals and not native. But the nice thing is, is even with the annuals, they come back every single year and they attract in all kinds of beneficial insects. I've seen um, aureus, I've seen syrphid flies, I've seen parasitic wasps. So this is a, a really good thing to have and to show your customers. So my thing is, is I believe in being as transparent as possible um, and uh, having people observe what's going on. And I wanted to show you, oops, I guess I didn't do that slide right. Um, but thank you for um, excusing my lack of techno um, intelligence. But I have these two great wor uh, um, uh, worksheets or from um, the Xerxes organization. Um, and I, I really like them. They're so chock full of information. Another of my favorites is um, the Native Plant Trust. So, but I would encourage you to like, um, I'm gonna leave this up for a while so you can take a picture of it with your cell phone. So one of these things is the first one up here is something that I give my customers. I always have a whole bunch of them on hand. It's buying bee safe plants. The questions, that customers need to ask. My, my um, goal is to make sure that we are totally transparent here about what we use um, and that we're, we're a place of, of education. Um, and then the second one is fact sheets for how to market and sell. Uh, it's for the, the nursery, how to sell your plants and, and get customers to, to be on your side, if you will. So, um, that's it for me. Um, if you have any questions, um, please fire away. Also, too, if you think of something later, don't hesitate to email me at uh, info at fullcirclegardens.com. I'm happy to help. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. Um, let me see. We have one question in the chat asking, do you have a favorite source of native plant seeds? Mm. <laughs> I have to choose one. <laughs> um, so I have, um, what is it? Is it Grow Wild, Kate Cruzy? Um, she and I, she has been wonderful about exchanging seeds with me. There's also a, a seed place in Connecticut Oh, I can't remember. Something 59, but it's out of Connecticut. Is it e Eco, Eco 59. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Um, another place I, I like to get seeds, for, as I collect seeds here, we have a lot of um, woodland um, plants here. We're uh, very fortunately on an 11, a 12 acre parcel. So I go into the woods and collect seeds like crazy there. I'm very... Um, I have lots of neighbors who are very willing to have me 
collect seeds on their property. So I do have my stuff here. Um, there's also um, Agricol is, a, is out in Wisconsin and, and there's Pinelands in New Jersey and they both have seeds, which I think even though they're not from these parts, they're helpful to, to get you started. So if you can't find the stuff around here, my goal is to have as many um, native varieties as possible because they serve so many different, um, different purposes for pollinators, for restoration. Um, so yeah, those are my, my three faves. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. We can move to Spencer and we should all uh, have time at the end as well to ask any other questions that might come up or and have discussion around this topic. Um, Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, so I'm going to, I'm coming at this from a very different angle um, and I'll tell you a little bit about my story and sort of where, how I've decided to, um, to find native and where I hopefully am headed with the farm upstream. Um, so for the past four or five years, I've been working for the Vermont Center for Eco Studies. Basically my job was to travel the state and to find every species of bee that we could. Um, there's like, I'll talk about it in a second, but there's a lot of different, uh, bee diversity and a lot of them are closely tied to um, rare and sort of obscure plants. Um, like this is an example here of a, a bee that's only found on sandbar willow, which is a plant I had never heard of before this job. Very briefly, there's uh, over 350 species of bees in Vermont at last count. Um, and we've been we've been working on this list and sort of figuring out what's here uh, through some field work and through visiting museum collections and spending a lot of time looking at looking for and looking at uh, funny plants like this Bee in the middle is a specialist on um, ground cherries and tomatillos. Uh, there's a, there's specialists on goldenrods and blueberries, asters, willows. Um, so that's where I've been spending a lot of my time coming up with this, this list of bees and, and, and then trying to figure out which species are in need of conservation concern. Sort of the second part of the project was to assess any trends and any information we had on uh, threats that were facing a lot of these bees. And, um, the short answer is we don't have enough information to, to make any really strong conclusions because no one had done this before and we didn't really have any baseline to compare to. Um, but there's, there's certainly reason to be concerned, especially uh, with the bumblebees. We know some species have disappeared in, uh, even in the past 20 years. Um, but a lot of these other bees, we really just, we don't know much about, but we do know that they need, they need plants and a lot of them need specific native plants. That work has, has led me to this project that Laura and I started through the Vermont Pollinator Working Group, um, primarily an outreach campaign with vegetable and fruit growers in the state, trying to increase awareness about pollinators that are providing, that are pollinating crops. I think we chose five or six um, commercial crops, squash being one of them, blueberries, apples, things that require insect mediated pollination. Um, so. And we came up with a list of the sort of the top five most important pollinating bee groups. Uh, in this case, bumblebees and squash bees probably do 90% of the squash pollination in Vermont. Um, but there are other important bees that are shown here. And then we just have this, each fact sheet has a little bit of information about each one, including uh, what people, farmers and what uh, the general public can do to support these bees that are then supporting the, the crop pollination. Uh, and this work sort of got me thinking more and more about the the native plant world and the the things that people can do to improve the uh, habitat around them for for pollinators that are both for conservation reasons and for um, pollination service reasons. And at the same time that I was doing this, I was also on the side starting the farm upstream. Um, we want, we formed in 2020, I believe, as a uh, wholesale vegetable farm. We've been on leased land for three seasons now. There's uh, four of us, the original members, um, sort of exploring the working relationship with the farm and building up markets and infrastructure and, and looking for land. And then uh, this past fall in September, we closed on a, a farm in Jericho here. 
and that th hopefully will become our our home and our a diversified veg and fruit and farm that I'm tying in a nursery component of and it's still still in the works um, but I've been experimenting with propagating native plants and have some stuff that uh, will be for sale in the next year and expanding on it uh, now that we have land and I keep hearing more and more as I was doing this bee work I was traveling around the state giving talks about about native bees and there was so there's demand out there uh it seems to be unmet for for native um native plants for people that are concerned about they want to help the bee populations in their backyard um and i've sort of from what i've seen and what people i've talked to it, there seems to i've been focusing on this uh gap of pollinator friendly shrubs that are also aesthetically pleasing that people might want to plant in a, in a yard or on a farmstead um, so my focus is going to be on on native shrubs, flowering shrubs that are beneficial to bees, and it, and as many of the specialist bees as um, as possible, given uh, the plants that they they prefer. So, and so, basically, to keep things simple, and because there seemed to be an interest in in really local, hyper local, um, eco or uh, genotype, I've decided that. For now, at least, I'm only going to grow things that come from from wild Vermont genetics. So I've been, um, as I was traveling the state doing this bee work, I was taking little cuttings here and there, or taking seeds, and um, starting like a, a founder nursery. So this is what I'm calling my hedge fund. It's examples of native plants that have come from from the wild via cuttings or seeds, and then those will be the source for a lot of the future propagation that we do uh, in, in addition to supplementing from from acorns and from wild seeds and additional cuttings as needed but i'm trying to build a collection of the of these somewhat obscure shrub species that are both beneficial to pollinators and uh, potentially aesthetic and of interest to consumers and um so from a thinking about what plants that people might want or what what plants are best for for pollinators in general, especially in an agricultural setting. But I think the big thing is that the environment has flowers blooming sort of from as soon as the snow melts through past the last frost, or for first frost. Um, because there's bees active this whole period and some species like bumblebees, they're active for much of the summer and they need they need food every day that they, they can. Um, so that's sort of one overarching target that I've been focused like, so you're starting with the willows, going through the dogwoods and through the summer, having something that's blooming at all times. Um, and then easy maintenance. It's a lot of the pollinator projects that I've been, I've heard of, or I've heard people talking about, they, they have a grand aspiration of installing a half acre of native pollinator meadow and they do all the work to get it established. And it uh, either takes an insane amount of weeding or it quickly gets overrun by, um, and other unintentional species. Um, so focusing on things that are fairly easy to maintain once they're established. And then from the agricultural perspective, there's a, there's concern about disease and pest spread, things like spotted wing drosophila that are known to attack the fleshy fruits of a lot of the, the nice pollinator shrubs and trees that um, many people might be interested in, but there's the pests are building up in the in the hedgerows and in the um, these pollinator plantings, and so I've been working on a list with Laura that, of things that are um, less likely to host pests, but then are also still beneficial to bees. So um, bees obviously feed their uh, need pollen and nectar. They feed their offspring um, pollen, which, but not all pollen is created equal. And pine trees are an example. They've got a massive amount of pollen. Uh, people get allergies from it, but it's very, you almost never uh, see bees using that pollen. Uh, and then like things like milkweed, their pollen is in a, it's in a form, it's called a pollinia. It's, it's not, as far as I can tell, beneficial to the bees. So the bees are visiting milkweed just for the nectar, which has its own value, but uh, it's the pollen that the, the brood is raised on and it's the protein source for the developing offspring. And then this, the last one that often gets overlooked is, is nesting habitat. So bees obviously need a 
place to, uh, to live and to, to build their nest. And uh, I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, and then native, I think that as Sarah mentioned, it's, it's complicated and there's a lot of ways to define it. Um, but the closer to, to Vermont native or local ecotype you can, the better, as far as I can, um, as far as I know, but I mean, there's no, there's nothing wrong with a lot of the non-native or native adjacent uh, native cultivars. Um, but the, the plants that the bees evolved with and that they're, they're visiting when they're in the, in sort of wild landscapes, um, I think is a good place to, to, to focus if possible. And then, so nesting, um, some examples of ways that bees are using plants for nesting. These small carpenter bees are um, surprisingly easy to find this time of year by opening up hollow stems of goldenrod or raspberries, um, even some of the mints that have a pithy stem. These small carpenter bees hollow it out, and this is where they leave their offspring to develop. And then um, leafcutter bees cut cool shapes out of leaves and they wrap their nests in these leaves. So, and then um, for other examples would be bumblebees nesting sort of at the base of um, shrubs or in thick uh, native grasses, which goes to so, sh say there's a lot more to the plants than just the, the pollen and nectar value. So circling back to this Know Your Five project that Laura and I have been working on, um, based off of the list of the bees that we generated for each crop, we went through and we found uh, five groups of plants that are best suited to support the bees that are supporting the crop pollination. Um, primarily it's bumblebees, but there's, there's other examples of um, mason bees and some of the sweat bees that are important crop pollinations in, uh, for some crops and in some circumstances. So we made this list of five plant groups that if you're only going to do five or if you have like this is the five to focus on on a in an agricultural setting to support crop pollinators um, and a lot of almost all of these at least some of these exist on almost all farms um, in Vermont so willows are ubiquitous on the landscape especially in wet areas um, but a good one to encourage for that early pollen source especially for bumblebees uh, sumac I know people don't love sumac because in some cases it takes over and um, but also it's a really valuable nectar and pollen source sort of in the, the late spring, early summer, when there's not a lot of other native plants available. Um, and then following that up a little later in the summer, spirea, also meadowsweet, um, a white flowered shrub on the, it's on the right side here that, uh, is present on a lot of farms, but often overlooked and, um, could be encouraged to support, uh, crop pollinators. And then sunflowers and goldenrods, people are familiar with, uh, and often can be found in overgrown fields and along field edges and can be grown and planted, um, but are really valuable for a variety of native bees and other crop pollinators. Uh, this is available on our the Vermont Center for Eco Studies website, slash know your five, and along with our other series of guides for blueberries, apples, squash, and a couple other crops. And then a few years back through the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, I generated this list of sort of like the gold standard of bee of plants to grow to support rare and unusual bees. Um, a lot of these are familiar nursery plants. Some of them are a little more obscure, um, but that have specialist associated bees. So like uh, maleberry or hehuckleberry, this leonia. Uh, it's only found a few places in Vermont, but there's bees that are only found on that shrub. Um, and you're not going to find them on anything anything else. This is also available on both the Farm Upstream website and um, the Vermont Center for Eco Studies website. But it's entirely all uh, native or at least genera that include native species. And then um, one more thing that we've created through this Vermont Pollinator Working Group and this is this is pretty new. Um, is a, a list of native plant uh, providers, suppliers, in mostly in Vermont, with some um, adjacent uh, businesses included on here. So, Eco uh, Fifty Nine, the one that was mentioned at the end of the last talk, was is also is on here. Um, there's some online seed order places that are in the region selling native plant seeds, and then 
any Vermont uh, nursery that I could find that was selling at least some portion of uh, native um, plants, native flowering plants. And I'm sure I missed places on here, but um, this list was came about from a realization that it was hard to find a lot of these uh, native plants in Vermont. And even if they're grown, they're not, um, not, not, every, not every nursery is gonna have them. They're not plants you necessarily would find at Home Depot, um, but there was a, seemed to be a desire to have all this information in one place so that um, people interested in, in planting native plants knew where to find them. Um, so if people have nurseries that they're aware of or, or run their own business and don't see it on this list, please feel free to reach out to me and I can add it. Um, the only criteria is that there are some native, as loosely defined native plants available. Yeah, and I think that is all I have. Happy to answer some questions. Awesome. Thank you, Spencer. And I'm not seeing anything in the chat right now. People can post questions there or feel free to unmute um, if you feel comfortable doing so. And I have a question. Um, this might be for Sarah and with your experience um, buying in seed and plants from different places to sell to your customers, are there any pro tips in terms of um, making sure your your stock is successful? So one one pro tip someone told me once about sourcing native seeds was to buy those seeds from maybe more than one source because sometimes some years they do really well from one source and then maybe the next year not so well for whatever reason with these kind of eco type types of plants that might be um, newer at the commercial scale. Um, so that's just one example. I was wondering if you have any other thoughts or experiences with that. I agree. Diversity is stability um, and get your seeds from a lot of different places. Not everybody has success with seeds. Um, they, they try and germ at seed companies will try and germinate them just to see how they do. But, you know, we, we can't see how they're stored or what it took to get them from point A to your place. Um, so I, I do. And I also understand too, when I buy seed um, or I collect seed, not everything is going to germinate. So um, when I uh, do that, um, I always get way more that, than I need. And I find that to be true. And it's, it's interesting, some seeds do great germinating and some not so well. They do the bowl, they do great germinating. And then after like, I don't know, two months they peter out and there's really no explanation. I've just, you know, I tried different soils. It seems like well draining stuff with fine particles does really well. Um, so that's a pro tip. Um, and so when you do collect seed, just go to different places locally. And, um, you know, if anyone wants to collect seed here, especially the woodland seeds, come on and help yourself. I'll show you where they are. But yeah, I think different places, um, collecting seed it is really good. That's my, my pro tip for the day. Awesome. And if anybody yeah. else here has thoughts on that, please feel free to chime in um, unmuting or in the chat. That'd be great. So I'll say that I think um, we're at a really excellent place in the industry where we can start. There's a consciousness about growing native plants for um, you know restoration as well as um, having them available in at, at people's homes. So I really think that this is a good time for us to have a, uh, us growers to have a conversation about um, how we do things. And I'm really glad, Laura, that you had this presentation today. I think um, th the more we keep talking about it and seeing how we can support each other, the, the, the better it, it is. So um, I would like to see, I mean, I hope that by the time I retire, um, most places 
carry a wide range of native plants and maybe that we bring our pollinators back, so. Thank you. Um, I was, I did mean to mention earlier that these guides that, that you're using, Sarah, and the ones that Spencer, you've highlighted in your talk, um, we can send those out if it's helpful for folks. Um, when we send out, there'll be a recording of this presentation, these presentations today that we'll send out. So um, no worries that they didn't, the links didn't work or whatever. We can um, get those out to folks if they're interested. Another um, word that keeps coming up that is, I mean, at least to me is a newer kind of terminology is this um, ecotype type of plants. There's so many definitions I feel for what is native or non-native. And um, in what I am finding people come back to is this, this um, idea of using ecotype plants. Does anybody feel comfortable describing what that means? So what it means is an ecotype is a plant that's grown, has been growing in a certain place. Um, I mean, case in point, um, in the back of our land, we have, um, if I collect seeds of the Joe Pye weed there, that's a, a local, like, like Spencer said, a hyper-local ecotype. Um, I know that, say, once again, Van Berkham Nursery is very conscientious about growing local ecotypes from seed and letting people know that in their catalog. And theirs is out of um, central New Hampshire. So some people, um, Folks who are, are want to plant native plants um, are very concerned about making sure that the seed comes from near where they're going to be putting them in. So, would a, um, a if a grower in New Hampshire uh, wants to get seeds from me, is that you know that's their definition um, that they need to sort out? Um, am I local enough, or am I too far away? Spencer, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, um, one, that Eco 59, that seed company, is it, that's reference to uh, Eco Zone, Eco Type, whatever they call it, 59, which there's a map of the, I think, of the country where areas have been defined based on climate and um, primarily winter temperatures, I assume. But, and that Eco Type is, I think, the 59 is Connecticut and gets into parts of Vermont. Um, mm -hmm. But it doesn't necessarily follow state boundaries, obviously. And um, I think the closer you can get to the ecotype, the better, but also realizing that a lot of these seeds aren't available commercially from, from local ecotypes. Um, and there's probably not a lot of difference between a Joe Pye weed from Southern New Hampshire and one from Northern Vermont. Um, there may be cases where there are differences, but it's better than any than not having a Joe Pye weed. Exactly. Great. Thank you. And one last question that I personally had was about us. Uh, Sarah, you were showing those um, kind of pest predator interactions and um, outcomes on that milkweed image that you showed. And I was, I just wanted to clarify, are you, are you just uh, not, not spraying your native plants intentionally so you can kind of show off that? Um, to your customers or just so you're not damaging the insect population there or how how is how are you managing that mm. so so this is how I roll I keep a few of those plants um, on the mats and then what I do is I take the rest of them the the tuberosa and the um, other stuff and I I hope this is okay this is what I do is I carefully transfer, well, this year we've, I mean, has been the worst season for, for caterpillars. I've had the most beautiful um, Asclepias syriaca um, that I've ever seen, which is really sad. But what I'll do is I'll transfer the caterpillars onto the, um, the damage plants for people to see. And then what I'll do is I'll get the hose and spray the aphids off of the other plants with water. And um, when things have kind of reached a, a balance, and the um, oleander aphids are, are 
knocked down, I'll bring the other plants back. And I just, it's, anyway, that that's um, how I roll with that. I really don't want to spray. Yeah. So you're selectively kind of managing that so that you have. Yes. Uh, and, yeah. you know, a lot, a lot of my pest management practices involve these sets of pinchers. And I, I just pick things off and, and um, dispatch them, shall we say, the, the bad stuff. This is also one of the best pest management, but if you have a, a large um, a large farm, it's you got to figure out something else. This isn't this is going to take all your time. I completely understand. Okay. Well, if we don't have any more questions today, um, then we can finish up a little bit early. And I just want to thank Sarah and Spencer and Ralph and um, the partnership with the VVBGA and the Vermont Nursery and Landscape Association for helping to get this together. And thank you to everybody who's here today listening in and asking questions. And please feel free to reach out and we will have a recording of all of this posted on the VVBGA YouTube channel if um, folks are interested and I'll be sure to share that recording with the VNLA as well in case it is um, can be made available to your membership. So thank you again and um, I hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Hi there, this is Andy Chamberlain and I just wanted to share the upcoming VVBGA webinars are coming up on the following Wednesdays from noon to 1. January 31st is Employee Handbooks on the Farm. February 7th, they're planning to discuss greenhouses, part one with uh, greenhouse setup. And February 14th, greenhouses, part two, growing bedding plants for early season sales.